Today on an all-new Dr. Phil. The homeless battle is once again heating up. Communities say, we don't want those people in our backyard. What do you say to a family whose daughter was stabbed to death by a homeless person? You put up a fence around your property to feel safe. I'm a prisoner in my own house. I'm barely making it. I'm living dime to dime. Who all's living in this RV that you have? Seven people. We gotta get out somehow, some way. Let's do it. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. This is a safe place to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is gonna be a changing day in your life. Five, four. Get ready to take care of you. Today, we're continuing our conversation about homelessness in America. Now, the problem and the solution are hotly debated topics with passionate advocates on all sides of the argument. Here's what happened yesterday. If you've been in downtown Denver recently, you can help but notice one of the many homeless camps lining the sidewalks. This is not just a big city problem. At first, it was a few homeless people. Now there's camps everywhere. How bad is homelessness? It's an epidemic. We have 1.2 million homeless children and half a million homeless adults. We talk about counting the homeless people as opposed to looking at the systemic causes and the systemic solutions to homelessness in America. Nothing ends homelessness like the home. The two biggest underlying causes are the lack of affordable housing and poverty. Is there any responsibility that you place on the people themselves rather than what the government's not doing? There may be substance abuse or mental health issues. Those are diseases. People are not responsible for diseases. What most people think homelessness is, is the homelessness you see. And that is the tip of the iceberg. The woman was brutally beaten by a homeless man at a metro bus stop. One of the ways to help prevent homelessness is to prevent it at the beginning. And the best place to do that is at our public schools. So they don't grow up to be mentally ill on the street. I agree. I, I don't think you do agree with me. You know? Because you want to address it when they're already on the street. I'm advocating for children that do not have safe access to parks without stepping on drug paraphernalia. That is unacceptable. We cannot claim that homeless advocates have the moral authority saying that, nope, we're going to let them have open camping because we don't have enough shelter. Do taxpayers that have parks in their neighborhoods, do they have the right to the peaceable use and existence of that property? The answer is yes. If we sat down and actually talked to each other as human beings rather than people on a talk show, we're supposed to do this out. Did you not want to we be would, here? No, I do want to be here. You don't What's have so to school us. We are actually I'm talking. I'm not trying to school you. I'm trying to reach out to you. We have to step back and evaluate what is failing. We have these encampments. That creates a danger, Dr. Phil, to everybody in the community. So is criminalizing quality of life crimes like street camping and panhandling a solution to homelessness? It's a debate that has many divided. The first time in years, there are no homeless camps at L.A.'s Echo Park Lake. The city says the recent sweep was a success. But critics say tonight the way the city handled it was a nightmare. I've never felt unsafe around my unhoused neighbors. I, I feel very unsafe now with the extreme amount of police presence that's here. It is night number one for a new and controversial homeless campsite in the city of Sacramento. This is triage. This is crisis response. It's essentially, you know, this is, this is homeless ER. It looks like a damn concentration camp. They're going trash it, just like they did the other places. People need a place to stay and some where that's safe and protected, so I think it's a, a good thing to have more spaces for people to live. A Texas bill, another step closer to becoming law, this would punish the homeless, requiring them to pay a fine in many cases for simply sleeping outside. The reality is this is completely impractical. The problem is there's just not enough shelter space. So if you're going to make it illegal for them to camp, the same people that sign those things also need to write checks on an alternative. 
Well, back today are Sarah Rankin, a professor at Seattle University School of Law, Paul Bowden, the organizing director for the Western Regional Advocacy Project in San Francisco, and Donald Whitehead, the executive director for the National Coalition for the Homeless in Washington, D.C. Also joining us are Mark Powell, a former San Diego County Board of Education vice president, as well as Cleo Patricic and Matt Makoviak, who are co-founders of Save Austin, now a nonpartisan citizenship group dedicated to protecting the quality of life in Austin, Texas. I I'm confounded by the fact that we do sometimes talk about homeless people as though it's a one-dimensional population, mm -hmm. and it is not. Mm -hmm. There are mentally ill there. There are drug addicts and alcoholics in there. There are jerks, l lazy people, uh, exploiters. And then there are people that were just one paycheck away from being homeless, and they hit that rough spot, and they're homeless. Mm -hmm. But they're all human beings. Mm -hmm. And I know they're all out there. It's not one-dimensional. I know that firsthand mm -hmm. because I've been homeless. Mm -hmm. And it was episodic, as you're talking about. It's not fun. It's not easy. But I also know there were some very nice people, and there were some people that were snakes. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not a one-dimensional population, mm -hmm. and not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't know how one solution is going to solve the problem. It's it's going to have to be dealt with not on a case-by-case -case basis, but certainly categorically. Isn't that true? Absolutely. We, we believe in multiple interventions. Mm -hmm. People get there in many different ways. They stay there for many different reasons. And so we need mm -hmm. multiple solutions. Um, I myself also experienced homelessness. And, and what I also want people to understand is the many, many people who have experienced homelessness, and like yourself, Dr. Phil, are now contributing to society. I feel like I'm contributing to society. Because as you said, the best way to move people is through kindness and compassion. How about and for the me, worst treatment to people... children who are not able to access safely their schools mm -hmm. and their parks? What about humanizing their existence in this in our country. We well, also right. have to support safe communities. How do you explain to the families? Oh, how do you explain to the families, Dr. Phil? And you you can you've probably had to deal with situations like this. We have to consult families that are grieving. What do you say to a family whose daughter was stabbed to death by a homeless person? So what do you say? Hold on. What do you say to the family of the of the homeless guy who pushes somebody in front of a trolley, or the person that was raped by a homeless person. See, see that's the problem. No, it's we, not a problem. We sensationalize I'm gonna, it's not no, just like because no, I'll tell you, homeless women are raped daily in these unregulated encampments. That's exactly what we rape need. happens in regular society. Absolutely, but what I'm saying, no one is society, safe in unregulated the, the encampments. No one majority is of homeless safe people in are more likely to be victimized that commit crimes. As we said, this isn't a one-dimensional population. There are people in this population that need to be dealt with in some way, just like there are people and in this population that are just this close to getting back to being able to contribute and help other people. They're all up and down the continuum. You can't just dismiss it. I said that in the beginning. Yeah. I said that there are people in the homeless population that mirror the rest of society. Because we know there's a lot of dangerous people in society, uh, but we can't Including characterize the property. entire population we based on those right incidents. But nobody, I don't think anybody's property. trying to yeah, characterize the entire population by the bad eggs in the population, but you can't dismiss them to the homeowners, to the school mothers and all, or you're going to lose all credibility. And I don't want to see that happen. There are dangerous people out there, and even if they're not homeless. Right. right. And there's there's house people who are dangerous. So we're just trying to say, like, there's, it doesn't the, do anything to sensationalize you can't it. Like we're not talking about people. access safely <laughs> public I, property, I, I, and we I have, have that right, or it's no, anarchy. It's I, anarchy. I, can we just... Okay. No, no one is saying, no one is advocating for encampments. Do you support open camping? What I support? I yes or no? What I support is housing people. Making sure I that do people not support who, open camping because it makes them less resistant to go to shelter. Haven for Hope, a 40-year successful homeless provider in San Antonio, 
begged for a camping ban because they say that is the only way for them to uh, agree to shelter and yep. services. We don't want to put homeless people in jail. The reason we talk about the homeless and the non-homeless is that the non-homeless are being asked to pay for everything the homeless needs. Monday, she's 73 and raising another grandchild. This was not your life plan. Absolutely not. You can write enabler on me. I know what I am. Yeah, I've got a Sharpie. Don't tempt me. Your mom says you come home, get in comfortable clothes, get on the couch and watch TV while your daughter's by herself. Will mom step up? You have a lot of excuses for not getting to the next level. I don't know how. That's Monday. Then on Tuesday. Award-winning actress Regina King's 26-year-old son took his life. I would train anything else one more time. Ranking the stressors in life, this is number one. That's Tuesday. Jennifer's story made headlines after she says she was forced to take matters into her own hands to protect herself and her property from a nearby encampment. Let's hear from her. It's gotten so bad over the last year, and I'm just over it. Jennifer Wilkins has lived on Glass Plant Road for 10 years. She lives and works on the property. Wilkins says it used to be quiet, but now she feels like she's living in a post-apocalyptic nightmare. There was a drive-by shooting here a couple months back. Right there. That's 50 feet from my door. She says last year, 20 catalytic converters were stolen from her customers. So she installed 64 cameras and an electric fence. 7,000 volts, so it'll hurt. My breaking point was last night. There was a domestic situation, and some guy drove his car into the slough. And I'm like, you know what? This is getting ridiculous. Right after that, as I'm walking my dog home, I get attacked by a dog that came from one of those camps. And I'm done. I'm just done. Well, joining us virtually from Portland, Oregon, is Jennifer. You've had to put up a, a fence around your property to feel safe, and when you go outside it, you, you don't feel safe. Well, it's made me feel like I'm a prisoner in my own home. I mean, you see the pictures. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable that people are living like that, and it's unacceptable that I have to live afraid to leave my own home. What do you suggest those people do? What 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 do you think should happen with those people? Because promise, I promise you, they don't choose well, to be living on the side of that road. The ones that I've been dealing with are, they're criminals. The, the, the police came in and actually tagged them all and said, you have to move or get arrested. So they started moving. And in one morning, they took 17 stolen cars out off of my road. Just mm -hmm. in one morning, like a three-hour window. That's not just a homeless situation. That's a criminal situation. Yeah, so it's not about the homeless people necessarily. It's about people that were committing crimes. And, and that's people what we have. But, 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 yeah. those people but, that but are not living, for being hold on homeless. A second. And if people are committing crimes, deal with the criminal activity. I think most advocates for the homeless population believe in two things. Housing first and allowing public camping. And you can shake your head, but that's, that's a simple truth. Because listen, if you look at, if you look, we, we've studied cities in America, one of which you're from, Seattle. We've studied Portland, we've studied San Francisco, Los Angeles, Chicago, New York, D.C., and yes, Austin, Texas. All nine of those cities have at one time had a camping ordinance. The problem with a camping ordinance is that it is unsafe, it is unsanitary, and most importantly, it is unregulated. We don't want to put homeless people in jail. What we want is for people to be in safe and sheltered environments mm -hmm. as much as possible. Mm -hmm. What we want is for taxpayers to be treated with respect. The reason... We talk about the homeless and the non-homeless is that the non-homeless are being asked to pay for everything the homeless need. So all we're asking for is accountability. And the simple fact is housing first does not require that. Housing first measures heads in beds. You're factually inaccurate. What am I factually inaccurate housing, about specifically? Housing first is a philosophy. No, it's part the of the state law in California. Called, the entire state of the California has housing first. The program that we're talking no, it, about, that we've, that we've is, talked about several times, is called permanent supportive housing. And all we're saying to you is there a, there's a more productive way of doing this. Don't raise money to, to raid encampments. Raise money to build housing. You want the same government who's causing these issues to solve it. The reason why homes are so expensive is because 35 to 50% for the cost 
to build a house or permit fees. They're government regulations. You guys keep looking for government to solve a problem that government's creating. That's why homes are expensive. There's I vacant buildings in every community. Oh, There's a whole program called Title V that makes federal property uh, <laughs> To, to, to be okay. used this for is, homeless programs. Yeah. However, okay. what happens is communities fight it. Communities say, mm -hmm. we don't want those people in our backyard. We have to take a break. We'll pick up after the break. We'll be right back. This deli owner shows us the 10 stitches in his head and a black eye from a fight last week. The city put 2,000 people that desperately need help in less than a five block area. Another effort to keep the homeless away. Someone put boulders on a sidewalk. I feel distraught because I don't know what happened to these people. I don't know if they're better off, worse off. One of the things that impacted me a lot, I was talking to homeless that were there and I ask them, what is your biggest worry or fear right now? And a few of them said, middle class homeless. They said, what's happened is now there are so many families that were one paycheck away from being homeless, that now that paycheck is gone and they are homeless. And they said they seem more organized. They absorb all of the resources at the food bank. They fill up all of the beds and the shelters. And by the time we get there in our normal pattern, there's nothing left. There's no food. There's no shelter. Well, today we're discussing homeless in America. And one of the things that I don't want to get lost in this debate is that homeless people are human beings. Now, we've had people take an issue back and forth with using the wrong term or what's the right thing. I don't think anybody means any disrespect. I, I think it's just a matter of what's the right terminology to use. Uh, I want to say I, I'm here to learn. So if I make a mistake in my terminology, it's a mistake. It's not a intended disrespect. So... The, the question that I have for everybody is, do we really know what the answer is? And do we know that we're not doing harm? The idea is not to win an argument, it's to solve a problem. Yep. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference in how you approach the situation if you're trying to solve a problem instead of just win out an argument. And if you've got a 90% success rate and that's measured by whether somebody's willing to keep a house you give them
well, yeah, but does that really reflect, are they getting closer to reentering society or not? And that's not 90%, but it does seem to be moving in the right direction, right? There's a an institute called the Cicero Institute that has done a study and a, a meta-analysis of other studies, and they say it appears that a permanent supportive housing may in fact not be working, that it seems to perhaps draw people into the system and that cities have to build 10 uh, PSH beds to remove a single homeless person uh, from the street because it does draw other people in. That removal of a sole homeless individual from the streets does seem to fade over time and that Housing First has caused many places to de-emphasize short-term shelters, such as San Francisco, who has fewer uh, shelter beds now because it's declined over the last decade, even though they've built more permanent supportive housing. Mm -hmm. uh, so where do you put the emphasis? Looking at supportive housing uh, studies, the vast majority of, of studies that have been done on supportive housing show that it is effective in terms of making sure, especially by one criterion, which is making sure that people don't return to homelessness, right? So that's where it's enormously effective. In terms of substance use treatment and mental health treatment, um, people who go into supportive housing pursue those at much higher rates than they do if they don't have housing. And because they're mm. choosing to engage in those services and treatment, the effects of that service, those services and treatment are far more robust and enduring. I am not anti-homeless. What I am is pro-resident. And yet we, I was called a Nazi. I was called a homeless hater. My next guest, Mark, is the president of Venice Stakeholders Association in Venice, California. He says that lax laws and social service programs that bring food and blankets to homeless people may be trying to help, but have caused an explosion of homelessness right in his own backyard. Take a look. For months, we've been hearing about a rash of fires in and around homeless encampments here in Venice. Fires happen almost nightly around Venice. There's shootings regularly. People are just sad and frustrated. Some of them starting fires, a lot of them screaming profanities, um, high and, and just screaming nonsense right in our backyard. It was terrifying. Well, joining us in the audience is Mark. Uh, Mark, thank you for being here. Uh, you're saying that these people are trying to help these human beings that are having a difficult time, but it sounds like you think they're enabling them. I don't think. I know they're enabling them. Um, about eight years ago, we had about 400 homeless people in Venice. The last count just before the pandemic, um, it was over 2,000. So what changed during those eight years? The new council member opened all the bathrooms at night, invited social service groups to come in and give out free food every day, handed out blankets, um, told the police to stand down on enforcing the curfew and to stop um, taking down tents. So the end result was that we had an influx from all over the nation. I am not anti-homeless. What I am is pro-resident. When a father brings his two young girls out to get in the car to go to school and there is someone screaming sexual obscenities and saying, I want to you little girl or fights between people at night at 2 a.m. in the morning. And when the father comes out and asks them politely, would you please be quiet? You're scaring my children. And the response is you. If you call the police, I'm going to firebomb your house. And I worked with 50 of my neighbors to raise $35,000 to build 55 planter boxes so that we created a situation where no one could put up tents because the planter boxes took their positions. And we reclaimed it for those families there. And yet we, I was called a Nazi. I was called a homeless hater. When in fact, I'm simply trying to protect those children and those families. So Donald, what do you... 
What do you think is the solution to a situation where you have a confrontive relationship like he's talking about where it's it, it's not sensationalizing, it's a day-to-day -day grind? Well, first of all, I would say uh, I'm sorry you and your community had to endure that, uh, but the answer isn't just to move people away. People who are outreach workers, who can gradually get people into services by capturing information. Um, they came out and did that, and, and that helped uh, to resolve that problem. We need more of that. One of the things from the mental health side that I'm concerned about is self-attribution and the pride of ownership, mm -hmm. because I, I think it's very important I think we learn about ourselves the way we learn about other people. We learn about other people by watching what they do, and based on that, we attribute certain traits and characteristics to them. Somebody shows up every day early and unlock the office, turn on the lights, mow the yard, whatever. We, we attribute them as being really buttoned up, go-getter types, and that's what we attribute them. Same thing with ourselves, our children. As they grow up, they watch themselves master their environment. They walk into school that first day and say, I did that. Went in there by myself, and I laid on my rug and took my nap. I mm -hmm. did all of this. That's how we form our self-image and self-esteem and self-worth. And I think it's important for people to feel like I've earned what I have. I wasn't given what I have. I, I wasn't treated like a victim. I wasn't treated like I, I have to be shepherded along. I earned something, and I, I think that's very important. That's one of the concerns I have with Housing First is what did they do to earn that what do they do to keep that, which I love having a caseworker that goes by on a regular basis for compliance, for accountability, but people need to be given the opportunity to have pride in what they have. That's how they build that momentum to get moving forward. What they do to deserve it is, is suffer from that, which just like we talked about before, the permanent supportive housing we're talking about is solely focused on people who are experiencing chronic homelessness. So remember, that's people who suffer from a disabling condition that's so intense and, and life-altering that they are incapable of, of maintaining a job or um, independently maintaining their own housing. So we don't. there's no point in trying to incentivize um, people who have such a deep chronic uh, disability that where that disability needs to be addressed and really their underlying human needs uh, need to be able to be addressed. They're, we're not demonizing homeless. They're, they're not saints right. or demons. It's the behavior. We built an app that really acts like a Yelp for homeless services to put the answers people need in the palm of their hand. Closed captioning provided by... My next guest is Pastor Wayne Walker. He is the CEO and pastor of an organization called Our Calling in Dallas, Texas. He has developed what I think is an amazing app to help people who are homeless, whether it's long-term, short-term, whatever. And joining us virtually is Pastor Wayne. Thanks for having me on. Really appreciate the lively discussion you guys are having. <laughs> yeah, you say that from there. <laughs> no, I do too. I think we've had a great discussion here. Uh, Wayne, tell us about our calling. Our calling is a discipleship ministry for the homeless community. We, a bunch of churches kind of got together and we worked together on two questions. One is we, we work spiritually with folks and really want them to connect to the Lord. But secondarily, it's how do we help them get off the streets? And we get a lot of people off the streets. We have we specifically work with those unsheltered individuals, the ones you're talking about in those encampments, people that are living in their cars, people that can't get into shelters because there's not enough room. We have street outreach teams out every single day. And when we have this giant facility, we have hundreds of people come in every day to work with all those service providers you guys are mentioning from mental health care to physical health, really trying to connect them with long-term strategies to end their homelessness. Well, Robin and I live in Dallas, and we have learned about this amazing app that you've developed, and it is a great way to connect. And tell us about what it does and how it works. 
So in all the discussions you guys are having about services and who needs what and those people that you just became homeless or those who want to get out of it or those who recently got into housing and need access to services, there's a big disconnect where people can't find them. So we built an app. It really acts like a Yelp for homeless services. It's got over 100,000 agencies listed across the country to really help people find the services that they need. Now it's got this nationwide database of service providers all over the US and it, it creates a solution oriented approach. So before COVID, we were delivered, the app was delivering about 4,000 referrals a week. Now it delivers about 65,000 referrals a day across the country. And it's a great way for all these pieces to come together to put the answers people need in the palm of their hand. Congratulations on that. That is a really proactive thing. And I'm going to put a link to our calling on our website because I know this all doesn't happen free. And if people want to make a donation, I'm going to put a button there that they can do that for Please. Uh, to support our calling. And uh, Robin and I are going to be the first ones to hit the button. So uh, nice. we'll, we'll do what we can to help out. And uh, I, I look forward to meeting you real soon, uh, Pastor Wayne. Robin and I would love to meet you when we're in Dallas. So we'll look forward to that very soon. Anytime. Thanks so much. Next, I traveled right outside of L.A. to visit a homeless family, up to seven people at times, living in a 270-square-foot RV after a medical emergency left them stranded. It's interesting how many people wind up on the street because of a medical emergency. Mm -hmm. you know, we're in a society of double-income families, and if one gets sick, sometimes that's all it takes for them to fall out and no longer be able to sustain things. You're going to be really interested in this hardworking, nice family. We'll be right back. You're down here because you want to be. Absolutely. Uh, I can't think of another place I want to be uh, than being here for these people. When I first got here, it was very daunting, but after a while, I, I became very comfortable. This is home to me. You have uh, rival gangs who come in uh, and work together in harmony to sell drugs to the people here, to keep them on an endless spiral of addiction, and make the hard work of the uh, service providers that much more challenging. The biggest thing I want to show these folks is love from a place that a lot of them have been taught not to expect it, and that's from a law enforcement officer. So I show them unconditional love. I want them to feel as if I'm treating them like someone from the Palisades, even though it's in Skid Row. When I started Dr. Phil 20 years ago, I made a promise to shine a bright light on important social issues. Today, we're talking about homelessness in America, and I'm here to learn. This is a human tragedy, and I wanted to put a human face on this crisis. So Robin and I traveled to a homeless community outside of L.A., where I spoke with Ryan and his wife, Nikita, for a very raw and real conversation about the circumstances that left them with no home and really a sense of helplessness. Take a look. I'm up near Santa Clarita, California, at the Cali Lake RV Resort. This is a place that has about 300 homeless people. You'll see looking over my shoulder, a lot of RVs, a lot of trailers. These are homeless people. They all want to do better. They all care about each other. Many of them have jobs and are working every day, but they just can't quite get above that line that puts them back in the mainstream of the world. You won't see a lot of mental illness here. You won't see a lot of alcoholism and drug addiction. What you're going to find is they don't fit the stereotype. Well, Ryan, Nikita, I appreciate you letting me come today and, and talk to you here. This is a place you found when you were really desperate to get off the street, right? One yes. guess. Well, I'm interested in finding out how you got to this point in your life and what your vision is for getting away from it. So we're going to sit down and talk about that. Sounds good. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. So how long have you been here? Just about a year, maybe a little over. Uh-huh. We've been moving around. We started out in our little condo, and we lost that. We were on the side of the street for a little bit, went to a different campground, couldn't stay there because they had time limits. And then we found this place, and we've been here and yeah. trying to get it back on our feet. What happened that you were unable to retain a 
four walls and a roof over your head. I got sick, and this, they still are not 100% what happened to me, but my immune system turned off. So medical crisis. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that was the first hiccup. COVID I, hit. I was way behind on bills as it was, and then COVID came in. I lost overtime. I lost hours, and it's just been a snowball downhill. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. If you, if you look at the statistics of why people get into major financial crisis, the number one reason is medical emergencies. Mm -hmm. I cashed in everything which I had, retirement, stocks, whatever I could, because I, I wanted my kids to have a roof, my family to have a roof over their heads. There is a stereotype of homeless people, and it is that they're unmotivated, drug addicts, drunks, some mentally ill, and I have to say, in all candor, that does describe a portion of homeless people. But you seem to not fall into that category even a little bit. Mm -mm. I work every day. I'm nothing like that. I come home to my family, cook dinner, go back to work. We're just a normal family, like everybody else that just hit some rough times and weren't able to get out of it. And you have a job now? Yes, I do. And if I could ask, how much money do you make? Do you get paid by the hour? I get paid by the hour. I make twenty-seven fifty. But with a family in California, Jeez, it, it, I'm barely making it. I'm living dollar to dollar, dime to dime, trying to figure out which bills need to be paid, which I could get away with pushing off a little bit, so I can have food for my family, make sure I have gas to get to work. So now you're living here, and who all's living in this RV? This is where we live. This is our 27-foot RV. It sleeps seven people. This is the master bedroom. This is where me and Nikita stay. It's our little tiny space. This is where our daughter Artemis sleeps. This is where another one of our sons sleeps. This is where our other daughter sleeps. And then if you follow me back here, this is where my mother-in-law and our another one of our sons sleeps. It's made a home for us and our family. What is your biggest barrier to getting into a condo, an apartment, a, a house, some kind of permanent living arrangement right now? It's the deposit because you have to save up for your first month and last month rent, which makes it hard. Banks won't take me because they don't see it as a feasible loan. My credit isn't where they want it. When we had the cash before buying the RV, we were trying anywhere and everywhere. And getting even a call back or a response back was just ridiculous. How are you going to get from where you are to being able to have a quality of life that reflects the hard work that you're doing? That's where we're stuck. That's where we're stuck. I just, all I could keep telling myself is just keep working and saving what little bits I can. I, I, we got to get out somehow, some way. It's, yeah, are you going. gaining on it or are you losing ground? We're gaining. It, we're gaining a little bit. It depends. I lost my truck because it got totaled in a car accident. As I feel like I'm getting a little bit up, something brings me right back down to zero and negative. So despite the fact that you're, you're working every day, you do feel like you're failing them? More than anything, because I can't provide a proper life for them. I, I, I feel like I could give them more, you know, like I'm fighting if I could feed them at nighttime and no kid should go hungry. And it's a horrible feeling knowing if your kid's going to make a dinner tonight, you know? Do they feel like they've got a bad situation? They miss their homes. It's hard on them. Like, I know they get stress for me because kids pick on them when they find out they live in a trailer. The kids are mean, they're cruel, you know? They have no filter. Do they make fun of them? Ridicule them? Yes, very. What like, do they say to them? Oh, you're poor. You live in a trailer park. My son's homeschooled now because of it. Do you ever get to the point where you feel like the any part of the stereotype is right uh, about homeless people that you are less than, that you don't measure up, that you can't cut it? Sometimes it comes and I think about it but I, I, I can't believe that because then I failed my family, but it crosses my mind all the time. It's hard to understand yeah. why we're here. Do you ever wonder, I married the wrong guy? No, I don't. Because I was there before this happened, and I know when I was with him and we were together, we were a team. So we went down together, we get lifted up together. I notice you are very supportive of him when he's saying that. I do that all the time. She I'd... supports me like no other. Like, she's my back. She's been there for me when I, to my downest time. He's the foundation of our household, and to have foundation, you need support, too. You got to keep your head up and um, 
and know who you are and don't let anybody define that for you. And we're trying to bring attention to and, and work on this. And I am really proud that you trusted enough to sit down and talk to me and tell me your story. Thank you for just uh, listening to our story. I'm proud to know both of you. How old is she? Six months. Cutie pie. Thank you. She's tiny. She likes adorable. If you want to hold her, you can, but... <laughs> I could hold her. Yes, yeah, if you want to. Okay. If you would yeah. like. I would love to. I know. So, uh, we have a grandbaby due this week. Oh, <gasps> congratulations. Adorable. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We're all the same. My final thoughts on how you at home can learn even more about the issue of homelessness in America after the break. up on Dr. Phil, visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter. You'll get weekly updates, live strategies, and exclusive video that you won't find anywhere else. Plus, on DrPhil.com, you can see sneak previews of upcoming shows. Log on today. I, I think it behooves us all to approach this from the standpoint of do no harm. I mean, is what we're doing really, really working? And the biggest concern I have is that we not approach this in a one-size-fits-all manner. I, of course, am particularly sensitized to the mentally ill part of the population, as well as the addicted population, whether it's alcohol or drugs. Uh, you, know, you can look at that and say, well, that's, they, they chose that. Well, let me tell you, addiction is a disease. It's a serious disease. It can be a fatal disease. Uh, it's resistant to treatment. It's subject to relapse. And uh, when it gets a grip, it's really, really difficult uh, to overcome. Mm -hmm. And these folks that are chronically homeless, these mental illnesses are chronic as well. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes we're talking about a, a psychotic disorder where people really have a difficult time organizing their thoughts. They have a difficult time maintaining focus, setting goals. Uh, and if that exists comorbidly with physical disabilities, let me tell you, it's just really hard to get traction. You can get into a state of what's called learned helplessness, where you believe that nothing you do mm -hmm. is going to change your circumstance. So I, I really caution all of us to not approach this as a one-size-fits-all, because those that are mentally ill, uh, those that are impaired, uh, it's like asking them to get taller. And we just simply have to be compassionate, particularly about those folks. Uh, and I, I say that whether we're talking about people that are homeless or not. Mm -hmm. And so that's just a really big deal to me. And I hope that we show compassion in that regard. Uh, I thank all six of y'all and Mark for being here and talking about this uh, respectfully and compassionately. I think there was a really good exchange of ideas. I learned something today. I, I hope uh, all of you at home did as well. Um, you know, I, I hope that we don't consider something a solution just when people stop being inconvenient mm -hmm. for us. That's not the solution.